thank you so much, Deborah. It's really lovely to meet you. Um, it's uh, It's been a real pleasure to have a look over the, your life's work and, and all the contributions that you've made to the area of inclusive education. But it's, it's even better here today to be able to gain insights from you directly. So firstly, thank you for agreeing to this. Um, do you mind if I ask, uh, I ask you how you got into this field and how you started working in this area? Oh, yes. Um, well, I've actually written about that. I don't know if you know that uh, Beth Berry and David Connor yeah. have a book. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but um, a number of us were asked to contribute uh, uh, in terms of how our teaching experiences had sh uh, shaped our research uh, and scholarship. Right. So uh, I can start way back to, to, to childhood. Um, you know, I remember... Uh, for example, uh, in about third grade, uh, there was a, a, a girl who came to our class. And back then, well, she, she, uh, uh, she was hearing impaired mm -hmm. and had big uh, hearing aids. And it was very obvious. The teacher in our class sent her to the back of the room where uh, no introductions, no commentary, no anything. Yeah. Uh, she was there. Her name was Rosemary. And uh, she was a beautiful little girl. And um, she was there for about, I, I want to say, three or four days when suddenly she just disappeared again with no comment. Yeah. And that was a moment of enlightenment to me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. oh, there's something wrong with her. She doesn't belong here. Uh, that's how it, it seemed. That's because in, you know, in the absence of any, any discussion whatsoever. Yeah. And, and throughout uh, my K-12 experience, there were other students, other yes, children um, with differences. And, you know, I don't want to prolong it, but um, the, the way that they were treated um, the, the, the stigma, the, the, um, the fact that they, they were treated as if they were not worthy left a big impression on me. Yeah. Um, um, so fast forward a bit. Um, I went to college, uh, majored in English, became uh, an English teacher. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, I went into, uh, I started my teaching career in um, 79. 80. And, um, you know, I, I had very little preparation in my uh, teacher education. Actually, most of my uh, college, my BA was more English literature and mm. a, a little dabble of uh, teaching teacher methods. Teacher education, yeah. Yeah, very yeah. little. Yeah. And um, very little was said about uh, students um, with learning uh, differences and so on. So mm. um, my first teaching assignment was uh, 11th grade. So what we call juniors, uh, 16, 17 year olds. Okay. And, you know, my impression was uh, that I would be teaching American literature and, and we would all have this wonderful time exploring, yeah, uh, yeah American literature. And the first thing that happened um, when I, I had a writing assignment and uh, one of my students um, submitted uh, a paper that was uh, so Ill illegible, so uh, impenetrable. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness, here's a student in the 11th grade, um, clearly uh, having big trouble with literacy and writing. And um, so, you know, I asked him to come to see me after school and he did. And um, I said, John, um, <laughs> let's talk about your paper. Can you tell me about it? And he proceeded to give me this wonderful uh, re review of what the paper was about. Mm -hmm. And he was so bright, so um, such a, a likable um in, engaging student and I thought oh my goodness mm -hmm. what what can I you know what how do I work with this student and I felt so incredibly ill-equipped yeah um you know the easy option would be just to, to fail him yes. you know to give him a failing grade and I, that 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 seemed wrong to me because the, he 
also added that he had, he had been diagnosed with a specific learning disability. Right. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm truly not prepared. Mm. Um, and there were no uh, provisions for, for students like that in school yet. The, uh, the federal law in the United States had been passed by Congress in 1975. Okay. And it hadn't been fully implemented. Mm. There was nowhere to go. There was no real, what do we, how do we support John? Mm. So I was very much uh, thrown in the deep end um, and on my own. Yeah. Uh, so that, that intrigued me. And then, you know, others like him. So while I enjoyed teaching English, I became so um, sort of captivated by those students. Um, and, and, the fairness issue um, around them. So I wound up uh, pursuing a master's degree in mm -hmm. learning disabilities right. and shifted into teaching secondary special education. Um, I, I was in a resource room uh, where I think the best description of that classroom was trying to spin plates. In, in my classroom was like a revolving door and I had the freshmen through seniors coming to me for support in every subject. And um, it seemed to me that um, the conditions in my classroom were of the last consideration and the students and their well-being were likewise yeah. the last thing considered. Um, it, it seemed uh, from everyone involved in the school, especially the administrators who evaluated me and, and so on, that as long as I uh, met the letter of the law, uh, it, it, it didn't really matter. Um, yeah, how, how good their instruction was or how uh, doable this was for yeah. the teacher. And uh, that, that intrigued me. It also intrigued me that most of my students were um, largely working class kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so mm -hmm. there were issues of class. There were issues of, of race and, 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 and so stigma, on. Some stigma kicks in at some point there too, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. And, and um, the, the, relationship with the general education classrooms whenever I try to um, have the kids in the general education classroom or keep them there, uh, uh, ask for accommodations. Uh, there was a lot of pushback. Yeah. A lot, a lot of pushback. Um, There's some funny stories involved, but um, one uh, earth science teacher <laughs> confronted the situation. Uh, he had, um, uh, uh, one of my freshmen my, uh, students uh, in, in his uh, earth science class, and he uh, really didn't think she belonged there. Mm. And um, he noted, he, he thoroughly read her, her file, and he noted that, you know, in one evaluation she had, uh, and I don't remember the details, but auditory discrimination problems in another, it was visual, you know, her, her, what is her specific learning disability? Yeah. And he pointed that out. And I thought to myself, you know, he's, he's got a point exactly. What is a learning disability? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and in many ways, I, you know, I, <laughs> I regretted that he had a point because his goal was to be, you know, to, to, to exclude mm. the student from his class, mm. but I couldn't argue with the point. Yes, yes. So that was an, another intriguing issue. Um, and, and there were just so many situations with so many students that, um, you know, advocacy was the biggest part of my work, I think. Mm. Uh, and it was, it was such an uphill battle. Um, if if I, I if a student managed to be successful in a general education classroom, I, I actually had a government teacher who was a revered teacher in that school. I revered revered her, um, but she she actually uh, went to the principal and accused me of of giving my student too much support, and and therefore it was unfair. Wow, wow. you know things like that kept popping yeah. up. <laughs> And um, so, you know, I noticed that my secondary students uh, really felt that school wasn't a place where they belonged. I'm sure they felt the stigma of having to go to, to my resource room 
Yep. Uh, they wanted to, uh, you know, get a car, get a job and get out of school. That was their real goal. Um, Expectations were, yeah. Well, it, it, it just didn't seem like they belonged. They were yeah. going to be at the bottom of the academic heap. Who wants to come to school every day feeling mm. like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, you know, the identification and uh, placement had so impacted their sense of confidence of themselves as learners. Um, and I thought, well, let me move to the elementary school and maybe maybe I can intervene on that process. Earlier. Mm -hmm. Earlier. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I, I taught for uh, nine years. Okay. In, in public schools. And later, I, you know, uh, the reconfirmation of how class plays a role, race plays a role, that those things kept kept coming Putting again. Mm. Yeah, mm. Um, and so finally, you know, I got to the point where I felt that um, my work as a teacher raised so many questions that I really needed answers to. And so I went off to graduate school. Mm. And uh, <laughs> uh, my PhD is from the University of Virginia. Right, I saw that, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of interesting given my body of work versus that of my mentors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we don't really see eye to eye. Uh, yeah. I, you know, appreciate and I'm very thankful to them. Um, yeah. Very great people. Uh, but we, we, we have diverged, obviously. And yeah. uh, so um, in any event, um, a lot of what I, in my doctoral program, uh, it was a very heavily quantitative, a lot of statistics courses, um, very, very much uh, empiricist, positivist, um, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. And then, of course, when I was in grad school, um, the regular education initiative and the inclusion movement was just gaining some steam. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, very distinct um, ideas about that. Uh, so I, I, I finished and I started my academic career. And I, I, I should note though, that while I was in my grad program, I took some qualitative research classes okay. and I was home, I was home. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the philosophical issues really, really um, intrigued me. Can I push you on that a little bit more? Can you describe to listeners like what caught you at that point? Because it's interesting you came from the kind of global uh, national quantitative piece into the qualitative. Often it's the other way around, right? Um, so what, what philosophical issues struck you? Well, you know, at, at the at the very beginning, it was um, that teaching and education are about human people. It's yeah. about people. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't think that I could articulate it at the time, but I've always been drawn to that, you know, that sense that what we do is moral. Um, that we're working mm -hmm. with people and mm -hmm. education is inherently a, a moral undertaking. Yeah. Um, and I can language it that way now, but then I could not. Mm -hmm. But um, there was so much authenticity uh, about, about the d doing qual qualitative research. And I, and I did a qualitative dissertation. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and that was uh, supportive. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I began, I mean, that started me off on the path of delving more deeply into those philosophical paradigmatic differences and, and mm -hmm. the implications that has for what we actually do with children mm -hmm. and young mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, I, from speaking with other contributors from the United States, um, I, I, I've noted that perhaps uh, Different universities, school, schools within university take different approaches. Um, whereas in the Irish context, the country is too small to, to have that. Uh, you know, we're, we're schools of education. And within that, there would be people who would um, be very much along the lines of main, maintaining special education, working very much alongside people who would be 
pro-inclusion or whatever terminology you want to, to put on that. Can you describe maybe what that situation is like and how you were able to, I, I can see what you're saying, that your background influenced your, your thinking, but how were you able to, to kind of decide and be, be confident about which approach you decided to take? Well, um, it's quite reductive, I know, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I don't think a decision was really, um, to me, uh, the, the direction that I took was one of conscience. Uh, you know, it wasn't really a decision. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I cannot imagine having gone down, uh, stayed consistent or true to uh, my training background, if you will. Mm. Um, uh, there were there was just too much at stake for me personally to mm. to, to do that. Mm. Um, I, 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 it's simply I can't imagine. Yeah. Not. Uh, so, uh, you know, I did a lot of reading. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a lot of reading, uh, and in those, uh, you know, in those early days when I was a younger academic, um, uh, there were other people. Um, we didn't necessarily know each other, but we got to know each other through each other's published work. Yeah, and um, it, it was it was kind of swimming upstream because the mainstream special education journals in the United States were very much dominated by um, uh, the more um, established view. Mm -hmm. And um, that would have been consistent with, you know, my my graduate program. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in uh, 98, I published, uh, I finally decided to, you know, have a voice here yeah. um, in a bigger way um, and I kind of go out there and um, publish a piece on um, questioning the scientific knowledge claims of special education. Okay. And that was tied up in um, a review for a very long time. Um, actually, Exceptional Children published it, but it, uh, I had had it in other special education journals it got some pretty brutal reviews. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> which which at, at a junior stage in your career is quite difficult, right? <laughs> yes, as, as an early career person, yes. Yeah. Um, but again, I couldn't see any way out of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had to do what I had to do. It, it, it just didn't seem to be a question. And, and, and exceptional children published it. I got yeah. actually letters from people, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, saying thank you, uh, okay. you know, being very supportive, and that was encouraging. Yeah, of course, uh, that was encouraging. And and the reviews that I got were were not reviews that were substantive in terms of um, critique that actually addressed the challenge that that I posed in the article. They were more personal attack kind of things, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. being called a psycho babbler right. And, right. and a usual suspect. And um, you, wow. it, it was, it was more, yeah, it was, they were, they were, I think, bordering on unprofessional, at, yeah, at, yeah. if not, if not actually being there. And I guess that sort of made me more determined. Yeah. Because um, I thought, well, you know, if you can't address the issues, if you can't tell me why I'm wrong in a way that that addresses the issues, then, mm -hmm. yeah, then I'm yeah. going to have to keep going. Um, so that's that's how that happened. And um, I did. And you did. And do you think that there was a, a, a broader change going on uh, in the U.S. at the time? Uh, do you think there was others like you? Um, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Getting to um, maybe, you know. So so what happened? Um, and. I'm trying to remember, it was in the late 90s at a uh, conference in Chicago, um, a small handful of us, actually there were about 12 people in the room, we we met to try to decide what are we going to do right. about this situation? Because 
so many of us, and even the people who preceded us, like Tom Skurdick and, and Liz Hasucius and Mary Poplin and, and some of those wonderful mm -hmm. people, um, it, you know, and their work had inspired me too. I, and I should have I should have mentioned that earlier. Richard Iano, um, you know, the, the, the book that I um, co-wrote with them, um, uh, Challenging Orthodoxy in Special mm -hmm. Education, was to bring their work back to the forefront because uh, to me, they were they were so influential. Yeah. Anyway, we, uh, you know, we couldn't get into mainstream U.S. special education journals very much. Occasionally we broke through. Um, and um, uh, what, how are we going to manage this? Uh, the Council for Exceptional Children was the big tent under, you know, spe where special all the special education of consequence happened. Mm. Um, and uh, Susan Gable um, had already, and this was really wonderful of her, she um, applied for us to be a, a special interest group at the American Educational Research Association. And that really is where disability studies and education was born in that room okay. with about mm -hmm. you know 12 people. Funny enough, yeah. Scott Danforth, uh, uh, Chris Cleaver, uh, and, and, and others that, that were there. Um, you know, just trying to figure out how yeah. we were going to negotiate what was then becoming an ever widening uh, chasm yeah. between um, the two two philosophical divides positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we were definitely the minority voice, the pro inclusion, um, and and uh, along with that. Um, debates over research methodology and so forth yeah running in parallel right um so in, because they're related <laughs> yeah yeah um in terms of your own research uh over say say since those kind of uh, important days in the late 1990s uh what did you do to try and address this and highlight it and uh you know provide evidence i suppose to try and persuade i I presume it's not just other academics, it's policy, right? And it's the mindset, the cultural and the attitudes piece, yes. right? Um, so what what kind of, how did your career develop after that? <laughs> well, I, you know, I centered on the, um, the research piece because the most powerful thing that the more established dominant group had was to claim the mantle of science. Yeah. We're the scientists, we're on the side of objective truth. The rest of you know the other people are are simply ideologues um, and and people who um, don't believe in science and um, they have to be wrong because we ha we have the superior knowledge claims to back us up and prove it and I thought okay well if if that those scientific knowledge claims uh, form the fundamental foundation for their argument that they're in the right and we're in the wrong, then mm. that that's what needs to be addressed. So yeah. the, the, the upshot of my research or scholarship has been uh, um, to uh, challenge those um, claims of science and um, whether they hold up under serious Scrutiny. Scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. And and from my perspective, they do not. Mm. They do not. And what specific areas did you look at? Can you maybe recall some of the specific projects that you did to kind of examine those areas that they were claiming? Well, you know, that first article, the scientific knowledge claims of special education. Mm. Um, uh, the their their claim to scientific objectivity were you know what was very problematic mm. so in terms of the the philosophy of science bringing that literature to bear on that um that claim mm -hmm. you know and and just how powerful are those claims really um yeah. so uh you know, in the physical sciences, um, the scientific method works pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> an engineer can, our yeah. engineers can figure out how to get that bridge to stay up. And if it doesn't yeah. stay, they can figure out what went wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. totally. And, and yeah. that's just not, that's not how, uh, this, the scientific method 
is misapplied to the, the, the social and human sciences. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that was what I was after. Yeah. That when you apply it to the social sciences, and, and I drew on, you know, my favorite philosophers or uh, just the most eminent philosophers of science. Um, Gadamer, Gadamer is, is really a favorite. Richard Rorty is, is Lawrence Hazelrig, um, Richard Bernstein. Yeah, those, those folks mm -hmm. had already shot so many holes in those scientific knowledge claims, those epistemological and ontological claims that um, just becoming very conversant, really immersing mm -hmm. myself in their work and others as well, um, gave me the tools to really um, thoroughly examine those, those knowledge claims and mm -hmm. um, to counter their supposed power to uh, shut down the conversation. Mm -hmm. So. Do you think that the, the a conversation took place throughout the, that, that period of your life in terms of did you operate in parallel or was there engagement with the kind of other discipline, the special ed discipline around those things? I had um, one particular engagement in 2006. Uh, Ed Saborni, uh, who was editor of the uh, journal Exceptionality, invited me to debate uh, uh, Jim Kaufman and uh, um, Sasso, uh, Gary Sasso, uh, who was at Iowa State. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, anyway, so yeah, there is a published debate exchange that yeah. was published. Um, and uh, so there was that level of engagement, but there were volleys back and forth in mm -hmm. articles um, uh, critiquing and counter critiquing and and so if, if you follow the literature during that period you can uh, see. see yeah yes and and like at a more broad level um what what happened in terms of a, a shift in thinking maybe over that last 30 well nearly 40 year period like wh what what else happened uh, apart from the kind of academic uh, push that was going on at the time well, I guess a lot happened, but I, I think that disability studies and education gained a lot of ground. Um, you know, we started with a small conference in Chicago and, and pretty soon, uh, you know, it had international attendance and uh, it, it, it was held in uh, international uh, venues yeah. uh, subsequent to that. Mm. It grew. Um, and I think it became increasingly more influential as, as young academics came into disability studies and education and mm. um, began to contribute to their voices mm. and their work. So I, I think we've, we've, there's been some progress, but mm. of course, institutionally, um, it, particularly in the special education uh, uh, world in the United States, um, the you know, I think with federal policy, they moved more toward inclusion as as the goal they aimed for, and um, so I think that has progress has been made there. But um, you know, some of the barriers to inclusion, I think, that are most important are pedagogical ones. Mm -hmm. And um, because, you know, they have a website, uh, the What Works website, that is entirely centered on um, uh, special education instructional interventions that, that, that work according to um, science, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the sci that, that, scientific, that, that whole cachet of science is still very, very alive and well. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is that uh, because um, those re that research methodology is so reductionistic, it drives um, the pedagogy to be reductionistic. Yeah. And um, that then gives um, credence to the idea, not real credence in my view, but credence to the idea that there needs to be a separate placement to do these highly specialized, very technical, very technician oriented kinds of um, instructional interventions. Yeah. 
so the, I mean, there's there's just this loop connecting. Yeah, <laughs> which, which means you have a separate profession, separate funding streams, outsourcing of of resources um, to come into students and schools. Right, it's the maintenance of that. Uh, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because mm-hmm. I, I think that's you know one thing that is is sort of being protected mm-hmm. by by that that whole um, mindset. Um, mm-hmm commitment and so forth so uh you know so and and the whole idea of let's have research to prove that inclusion works or doesn't work what's the criteria Mm. Mm. and and uh what what method what methodological commitment are we going to approach that question with Mm. makes all the difference in the world yeah Um, so um, you know, there's a self-affirming feedback loop here going on that's that's fairly impenetrable. Yeah. Um, you described at the beginning your early career. If if there was a, a English teacher starting now, um, how different would it be for them if they came across, say, this couple of students that you described? Um, is there supports available? Uh, is the idea of a student with specific needs in the classroom a shared uh, kind of sense of responsibility? Um, what I suppose that's a long way of me asking, what's the issues today? Well, the issues I think are, um, to state it briefly, is, is that tradition has, um, there are a lot of, things in place that maintain the tradition of pathologizing students, Mm -hmm. uh, of of sort of keeping, uh, preventing inclusion from from happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, these students are, the traditional thought is that these students are different in a way that makes a difference. They they, um, need a a certain kind of different education. I think stu- uh, teachers are still um, made to feel that they aren't up yeah. to the uh, task of being able to work with those students, that they're exotic, um, that they... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, um, it's, gen- it's clear a lot of the time, right? Yeah, so generally speaking, I, I think that... Um, We've come some way, but there's a there's a long way to go um, in terms of. I, I think we need to reimagine the general education classroom mm. dramatically for every student. Mm. Uh, you mentioned that you're interested in UDL. Mm. Um, mm. We still have such traditional instructional practices, and and, and that's driven in part by norm reference testing mm. and accountability measures and. Um, uh, claims to scientific research and what what works and all of that rhetoric is very compelling to the public. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what many of us have been trying to say over the years doesn't fit on a bump, bumper sticker. Yeah. And, and even even debating uh, those who are on the other side of that philosophical divide, um, you people really do need to read more. <laughs> Yeah, it's not uh, uh, it's not as black and white maybe as as it appears as well. Um, right. I suppose this 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 podcast series and last year's podcast series has shown me that this this nuance <laughs> everywhere. You know, uh, it's not them and them and us uh, really. There's quite a lot of of, of uh, gray, right? Mm. And, and there are just some beliefs and uh, uh, some very um, strong uh, ethos that need to be overcome, uh, cultural ones. You know, schools are still infatuated with sorting and selecting students. Mm. Mm. Um, and, you know, of course, the, the normal curve and the norm reference testing, um, that's what that is for, for creating hierarchies, uh, for relegating some, you know, to the top, bottom, and middle. Um, yeah. <laughs> And um, so that whole competitive ethos, mm. and and uh, particularly in the United States, the um, individualism mm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, the whole idea of exceptionalism, uh, those mm-hmm. things that are, are so driven by, well, capitalist ideology, th- those things are so firmly rooted. Um, to have inclusion, uh, to me, would mean that, uh, that the classroom would look very different and we would view ed- the purpose of education very differently. Yeah. The classroom would have to look very different we'd have to view student differences very differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so those are, those are big hurdles. Yeah. Th- those yeah. are huge hurdles. Well, so big questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that whole n- normal curve mentality, which emerged from the eugenics movement really needs to, uh, to go. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think as teachers, it's important that instead of, you know, th- there's a mentality that we have to catch students up and we have to get them to normal or above, which of course is impossible on a, a forced normal distribution, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so some of the things that I, I would urge my students going into teaching, um, that your job is as an intellectual worker. Mm. Um, you are um, y- you are constructing. You are co-constructing knowledge with your students. Yeah. And um, your goal is not to catch students up and to normalize them, but to make sure that every student who comes into your classroom is more informed, more skilled, and better people than they were when they came. And let's drop the notion of comparing students to each other. Yeah. None of that is necessary for instruction. Mm-hmm. Not a bit of it. No. Um, and uh, you, you, inter- you talked about being interested in universal design. I think that for our part, uh, pro-inclusionists need to talk more about what that classroom looks like because people who are skeptical of inclusion, mm-hmm. um, I, I think they envision, uh, if, if you read their work very carefully, and if you listen to their voices, um, they start from the premise that the general education classroom is the real world, yeah. which isn't, cannot be changed. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. And that, that's a problematic premise. Mm-hmm. So what if we had classrooms where students' differences were just that differences? Yeah. And, and that it is a, a, a moral, um, um, responsibility of teachers to be responsible for what meaning they bring to that difference yeah. and how in their classrooms their instruction is arranged, their assessment is arranged uh, to either make those differences and make a big bad difference yeah. or not. Yeah. See, that choice is there. Mm-hmm. So in a classroom that is universally designed, that has now amazing assistive technology, Mm -hmm. that is project-based and problem-based, and the pedagogy is informed by constructivist frameworks, uh, students can be working together. Those differences can... uh, you know, can result in wonderful things and not be a problem Mm -hmm. Um, as long as we quit making invidious comparisons. We don't have to compare students to each other to be very effective teachers for them. Mm -hmm. And in that way, that classroom would be so incredibly flexible for the most accelerated to the, the you know the students who, for example, struggle with literacy or mm. have other other kinds of um, um, forms of difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and um, you know, with cooperative and collaborative uh, forms of instruction, where um, teachers are making sense of new knowledge with students, mm. they're they're not just learning things, but they're bringing that knowledge to bear to create something meaningful for themselves. Yeah. That, that classroom is incredibly flexible and it's mm-hmm. a very different classroom from the traditional one. So that vision of what that inclusive classroom should look like, I think needs to be um, articulated. Mm-hmm. It, 
to be presented so that um, we remove that idea that um, the, the current status of the general education classroom is fixed in stone and can never change. Yeah. And therefore, you know, uh, the argument that we're going to send kids into a general education classroom that's going to um, create a failure experience for them. That's not necessary. It gets removed then, right? Yeah. Yes, remove it. Do you want to point our listeners to any uh, research that you are doing or a website that can find out more information about your work? You know, I don't have a website. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm uh, I'm pretty introverted. So no, I, I, I actually don't have a website, but there's a lot of marvelous uh, research out there. And I, I would uh, most of all say read, read. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed our chat.